this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. We're going to start our search for the lost tribes where they were last reported to be located. That is in ancient Assyria and Media. Now, this is in northern modern Iraq and Iran. Our first clue to the ultimate fate of the lost tribes was found by the archaeologists in excavating the Assyrian Royal Library at Nineveh. That is in the ruins of the palace of uh, Sargon II. They were in the form of cuneiform tablets, such as you see here. These were actually uncovered over a century ago, translated in 1930 by Professor Waterman of the University of Michigan. But their relevance to Israel was completely overlooked. This was because they were in complete disorder among some other 1,400 other texts, and no Israel words or names appeared. One tablet, dated 707 B.C., referred to a land called Gumir, which was occupied by people called Gumira or Gimera. Now, this was a very area the Israelites had been placed just 14 years previously. Gamir, we believe, is evidently a corruption of Gomri, the Assyrian name for Israel, formed by the inversion of the final syllable, I-R, to R, I should say R-I, to I-R. Such inversions are very common in Assyrian writings. These tablets were actually spy reports sent to the Assyrian king from a frontier post, the king being that time was Sargon. These reports covered a large period of time. That's fascinating. Now, these reports, what did they say? Well, among other things, they reported that the exiled Israelites were not slaves. They were actually freemen. Had their own homes, their cities, towns, uh, engaged in various activities. They had agriculture, manufacture. Would you believe they even had their own standing army? Now, this is, sounds strange, but consider the fact why were the Israelites in Assyria. Now, Assyria in the past, any time they occupied, I should say, subjected an area, they merely sent their overseers there to extract a tribute and so on. But with the Israelites, this is an exception. They brought these men up to Assyria to act as buffers around the borders of the country. In other words, these, evidently they were fierce fighters in those days. Well, what do you mean, buffers? Well, for instance, any outside invasion coming directed toward Assyria, they'd have to penetrate first through the Israelite lines. That means the Israelites would have to fight for their lives, either repulse the enemy or at least, uh, you might say, weaken them before they got to Assyria proper. Now, we can prove this because uh, one series of tablets uh, reported the invasion of Uratu, the king of Uratu, came against Assyria, and they had to penetrate first through the Israelites. Now, one of the tablets makes it very clear the Israelites put up resistance, they fought, actually repulsed the armies, and then turned around and invaded Uratu in, in, in exchange. In fact, they not only uh, captured or killed, see, all their army commanders, even sacked the country. Now, archaeologists had known for years the uh, capital of Sar uh, Uratu had been sacked and destroyed. They never knew who did it. Now, the tablets for the first time reveal these were Israelites that did it. It's fascinating. You know, it makes sense, too, that uh, they would set them there because, in other words, if there's an invading army, they're going to have to come through their land, so they've got to defend their own land that they're working, their families, and that type of thing. That's interesting. Another and later Assyrian report states, in the second year of Ursa Hayden the king, now this is about 679 B.C., the Gimera, as the Israelites were then called, rose in rebellion under their leader, Tuespa. We don't know if Tuespa was a woman or a man at this stage. They fled westward. Now, the Greeks reported these same activities. They called the Gimera Kimeroi in their records. Now, that name is translated into English as Kimerians. Now, the branch of Israelites, now known as Kimerians, moved out of Asia Minor, around and sometimes across the Black Sea, settling in the Crimea and the Carpathian regions west of the Black Sea. We find this called in 2nd Ezra, or Sereth, or Mountains of Sereth. Now, later when Babylon conquered the Assyrian Empire, this is about see, 612 B.C., they then invaded that part of Media where the Israelites, or Gimera, had, that had not escaped, were still there, and settled. And that, of course, drove the Gimera out of their area, some of them moving up through the uh, Caucasus, 
uh, the, what we call today the Pass of Israel. I should say that some historians refer to that as the Pass of Israel. Others moved around the uh, east of the Caspian Sea and became known as Iskuzi, a name very easily derived from Isaac. Then these tablets that allow us to learn these things really provide a very valuable archaeological clue, don't they? Yes, they do. There's another major clue to tracing the lost tribes of Israel. It's found on the side of a hill in northern Persia. It's in inscribed writings about 300 feet above the base of the mountain, the hill. Now, the inscriptions were actually carved in Akkadian, Elamite, and Old Persian languages. All three told the same story. The inscriptions show that the Babylonian name Gimara was written Saka on the Persian inscription, proving that the Gimara and the Saka were the same people. Now, the Greeks called these Scythians, I should say they called the Saka, Scythians in all their records. This is the first mention of the word Scythian. It's also interesting to note that the various names of Gimara are called all have the same root, S-K, as Isaac. Now, before the tribes went into exile, they called themselves the House of Isaac. You can find this in the Bible in Amos 4, verses 7 and 16, I believe. Archaeology has not only identified these Scythians as members of the lost tribes of Israel, but for the first time provided us with realistic, lifelike pictures of what the ancient Hebrews people look like. Now, unlike the stylized uh, pictures we see the Egyptians made and formalized or stylized stone carvings uh, made by the Babylonians and Persians, excavated from Scythian tombs north of the Caucasus are found skillfully made gold work showing the everyday life of the Scythians. Here, two Scythian horsemen are astride their horses. Two Scythians here are fighting back to back using bows and arrows. Now this reminds us of the little tribe of Benjamin that had, according to the Bible, 280,000 men of valor that bore shields and drew the bow. Now to continue tracing the Israelites, under pressure from the Medes and the Persians, the Scythians, now this is the eastern branch of the Israelites, they migrated north of the Black Sea, coming into collision with the Cimmerians. Now the Cimmerians, I consider them the western branch of the Israelites. These people had settled in the Carpathian regions. Now, the kinship lost during the passing centuries, ensuing battles, ended with the Cimmerians being pushed out of this area, and they moved, moved westward. The Cimmerians then broke into two major groups, the larger part migrating up the Danube River Valley, arriving at its source in South Germany between 600 and 100 B.C. Now, Roman historians, they call these people Celts. This is the first mention now of the word Celt. A small group moved into the sparsely inhabited regions of the Baltic, but the Romans called them by the abbreviated name of Cimbri. Now between the 4th and 1st centuries B.C., the Sarmatians, now these are a mixed non-Israelitish people, we believe partly Iranian, were pushing westward. They finally moved into the area of the then prosperous Scythian nation. Continued warfare then drove the Scythians out of their land, as they had done the Cimmerians and the majority northward toward the Baltic areas. Now, by the end of the second century B.C., we find only two small pockets of Scythians left on the shores of the Black Sea. Now, the Scythians, in turn, pushed the Cimbri westward to Jutland and the coast of Holland. Now, during this period of time, the Celts were expanding in all directions, many of them pouring into Britain to form the bedrock of the British race. About uh, 3000 B.C., uh, some of the Celts invaded Italy and sacked Rome. Others migrated back into Asia Minor, where they, they were called Galatians by the Greeks. We now know that Paul's letters to the Galatians were to his kinsmen Israelites, that is, descendants of the earlier Galatians, although called Gentiles by the modern Bible translators. You know, that really helps to clear up to a degree or major degree, this term Gentile. A lot of people have a lot of problems with it, mm -hmm. but the word itself is ethnos, and it means nations. That's right. And what you're talking about here are nations, and of course God told Abraham, you see, he was going to form a multitude of nations. Those nations would definitely be Israelites. Now, as the Sarmatians occupied Scythia in South Russia, there was a tendency to confuse them with the Sarmatians, because people are usually identified by the name of the land they live in. Now, the Romans, they solved the problem. They introduced the word Germans 
for Scythians. Now, the word uh, genuine, or genuous, uh, genuine, I should say, is Germanus or Germani. That's the Latin word for genuine. So in all the Roman records, except for a few outland areas, they dropped the name Scythian in all the Roman records. They applied the word Sarmatians or Germans. Now, from that, well, I guess you get, you get the picture. Oh, no, it's fascinating, yes. Now, don't think for a minute we're talking about the German nation today. Right. The uh, Cimbri were eventually driven out of northwest Europe. One group migrated to Italy, were nearly all wiped out by the Romans. One group made their way back into Spain to be known as Ibrius. Now, Ibrius is the Gaelic name for Hebrews. And eventually, many of those migrated into uh, the Ireland as Scots. They named the island Hibernia, that early name for Ireland, a name that still exists. One group crossed the English Channel into northern Britain to form the, I should say, form the roots of the nation of the Picts. Now, during the succeeding centuries, the Scythian Germanic peoples broke into many divisions, possibly in some instances into their original Israel tribal families, like the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes, and Vikings, to name just a few. Now, between 450 and 600 A.D., some of the Angles and Saxons moved into Britain as Anglo-Saxons. The Celtic Scots, for the most part, moved into northern Britain and established the nation of Scotland. Although some settled in northern Wales, the Isles of Man, the Scilly Islands. Now, many Germanic tribes poured into the land south. That is, after the Celts began to move out and vacate the land, these Germanic tribes established the Gothic nations, the Vandals, Lombards, Franks, Burgundians, Visigoths, Ostrogoths. These Scythian Germanic people, or tribes, formed the modern German, Swiss, French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese nations of the day. Although there has been, over the centuries, an infusion of non-Israel blood in these nations. The northern Scythian Israelites that had settled in Scandinavia, we read of them in history, raiding and establishing colonies in Western Europe, Britain, and Ireland. One group settled in France became known as Normans, who later forced their way into England under William the Conqueror in 1066. What happened to the lost tribes of Israel? You now know the answer. They were never really lost. They only lost their identity as they migrated over the centuries westward. You know, suddenly when you put the historical research that you have in your book, The Missing Links, and you couple the cuneiform tablets of the Assyrian Empire that you have studied, mm -hmm. suddenly you have the keys that not only show they were not lost, but that God was keeping his promise all along, wasn't he? He said they would go to the north, to the south, the east, and the west. There's one thing that came to my mind as you were talking, and I brought this out in an earlier teaching, and that is Ephraim and Manasseh. Then it seems like what you're saying there, that the, these people formed the bedrock of the British nation, which formed a multitude of nations themselves. It would almost seem then that they at least represented, uh, or in a representative way, uh, one of his children, Ephraim of Nassau. What do you think? Uh, you're right. I'd like to add one other point. Our Celto-Saxon ancestors, they first settled in Western Europe and in Scandinavia in the Isles of the West in fulfillment, fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, verse 10, which reads, Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles afar of off and say, He that scattereth Israel shall gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. I believe America is a regathering of Israel where we have been, as was prophesied in the Bible, quote, blind to our identity. I believe that we whose roots are traced back to Abraham are Abraham's children, of which God said, as long as the sun, moon, and stars exist, so will the descendants of Abraham continue as a nation before me.